So it's very exciting. Uh, Pesach is coming up. Begins this Friday night. So of course that's what we're going to be speaking about. These Devere Torah are based on Rav Bernstein's uh, uh, Shiurim, or actually very much his Haggadah. Uh, it was released a few years ago. It's called Darkness to Destiny, the Haggadah Experience. And, uh, and also, um, just a little bit outside the Haggadah, it's also his Shiurim online. Okay, so first things first, I want to discuss um, what, what overall are we supposed to be taking away from, uh, from the, first from the Seder, from Pesach overall. These are some very broad questions. And hopefully by dealing with uh, specific questions, we'll be able to get to this, this broader feel. So the first question is this, that Pesach is on Friday night. And being on Friday night, we actually have a number of uh, mitzvahs in Midel Raita to fulfill. Biblical obligations. These are high-powered mitzvahs. So just to differentiate, so for example, eating matzah on, uh, on Friday night is actually a mitzvah Midel Raita, uh, as opposed to, say, drinking the four cups. Drinking four cups is a mitzvah. Uh, it's a mitzvah Midel Raita. It's a rabbinic mitzvah. But eating matzah uh, is a mitzvah Midel Raita. And as such, there's actually a certain shiur. There's a requisite amount that you have to eat. You can't get away with just eating a small thimbleful. There's a, it's a, it's something called the kazait. Um, it's a fairly large amount depending on who you are, but either way, uh, ask your uh, qualified local Orthodox rabbi and he'll tell you how much you need to eat. Okay, so that's one mitzvah. There's another mitzvah, and that mitzvah is magid. That's one of the sections of the Haggadah, and it comes from the Pasuk that we see in the response to one of the, uh, to one of the children, that is to say, one of the four sons, V'she'enu yudea lishol, al-patach lo she'neemar, and here is the source of the Mitzvah Medeo Raita to tell Magid, You shall tell your child on that day, because of this Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. So as such, there is a Mitzvah, There is a Mitzvah to tell the story of leaving the land of Egypt, and that is what the Seder is based around. That's what we're supposed to be doing, uh, and that's why the section of Magid is so long, because we're engaging in that Mitzvah of retelling, um, and we want to convey the story and uh, what's going on to to children or to teenagers or to adults according to their age group. If it's a younger child, obviously you should be dealing with specific types of Debrei Torah. Don't make it too sophisticated. If they're adults, then obviously try to speak to them at their level. Don't make them too simple. Okay? But there's a basic question we need to ask. Since Magid is a mitzvah midi right? Is a, is a mitzvah midi Torah, why don't we say a bracha before we engage in it? But it's the same. When we sit in a sukkah, when we're about to eat in a sukkah on Sukkot, then before we do so, we say a mitzvah, leshev sukkah. We make a bracha, leshev sukkah. Before we pick up a lulav on Sukkot, we say, bracha Hashem, alantila lulav. So, so too, tonight, before we eat the mas, we say, alachilat matzah. So, why don't we say, like, bracha Hashem, like, let's appear with Yat Mitzrayim, to tell the story of leaving Egypt? Why doesn't Magus start with that? That is a question that a number of Mepharshim have dealt with. I want to share one uh, one with you, one that is shared in uh, in Reverence in Zagada. He quotes the Svat Emet, who is a uh, who is a huge gone and massive Talmud Chacham. He was a uh, Hasidic Rebbe, I think, of the Ger Hasidim. He was the second Rebbe, uh, and his answer is the following: that is based on a principle regarding blessings regarding blessings that is found in a number of uh, a mitzvot. That is to say, when it's something that would be dictated by human intellect, then you do not say a bracha. That is actually the source for the reason why we do not say brachas when you're doing something being Adam al between men and his fellow man. After all, giving tzedakah is a mitzvah midoraita, and you don't hear a bracha before that. Um, not giving bad eitza is a mitzvah, right? Not giving someone bad advice, um, telling them to invest in a stock because you get uh, a kickback from it. And there are a number of other things between, uh, between men and his fellow man, and we do not say a bracha. And that's because it's dictated by human intellect, and when it's dictated by human intellect, you don't say a bracha. And so how does that relate to the mitzvah of Magid? Because Rav Nachman, I think in the Talmud Yerushalmi, asks his servant Daru. Rav Nachman was a Talmudic sage, and he asked his, uh, his slave Daru, he said, what should a person do, uh, what should a slave do, if he's released by his master and showered with gifts? And Daru said, he should praise his master. That's what he should do. Um, and so, we see that really, if you just ask the person, what would you do if you were released and, and, uh, and set free with gifts, then you'd praise them. And that's exactly what we're doing with Magid. So because it's dictated by human intellect, it's intuited by human beings, then we don't say a bracha. And by the way, so how does this relate to the, to the Sipur of Yetzim Yitzrayim? So of course, when we were re released from Egypt, that part everybody knows. What well, may not be as well known, even though there are specific psukim in the Torah, 
So Akar commanded Moshe to tell the Jewish people to go to, the, to our Egyptian neighbors and ask them to lend us uh, their wealth. And then we took it and we left. Um, and that was as compensation for having been slaves. Uh, it was also as a meet connected for the Egyptians tricking us into slavery. So we tricked them into giving us their wealth. So fun. So here we see that we were slaves and we were released. Uh, and that's part of what's going on in Maqed. And that's why we do not say a bracha according to the Sfat Emet. So fun. That is section one. But the second part I want to focus on is the four questions. That is to say, there are obviously four very famous questions that the children ask. Um, how is this night different from every other night? So our question is, um, what is the connection between all four of these questions? Are they all, are, is each one of these a separate question, or is it just kind of meant to be seen as an overall uh, cast on, a, on the Seder? Is it just to kind of give our children ideas for the kinds of questions they can ask? What's going on? And moreover, what's the, what's the deal with the, with, this, with the Seder's answer? So we ask all these questions, and it says, Avadim hayinu l'farob mitzrayim, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and Hashem, our God, took us out from there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. So what's the connection? Maha keshev, as Israelis would ask. So let's look at each one of these questions. So one, I'll just read it in English. For on all nights we eat chametz and matzah, but on this night we eat only matzah. So why tonight are we eating only matzah and not also chametz? Um, the second question is, on all other nights, we eat other vegetables. But on this night, we are only eating bitter herbs. That's question two. Question three. On all nights, we do not dip our food even once. And on this night, we do we dip it twice. And then fourth, and finally, for on all nights, we eat either sitting up, upright or reclining. And on this night, we all recline. So what's going on? What's the connection between these four? So Rav Brinson quotes the Abarbanel, and he says, really, these aren't four separate questions. These are all all four of these questions are really based around one question that the child is asking. This is say, we seem to be celebrating two completely different things. The first two questions, that are, why are we eating only matzah? Why are we dipping bitter herbs in, as opposed to other vegetables? Is because that stuff seems to be commemorating our oppression as slaves. So that's not so great. But the second two questions are, on this night we dip our food twice, which is a sign of freedom and celebration, and then, the, and then the last question is, we either sit upright or reclining on other nights, but tonight, we all recline as if we're kings. So what's the deal? The first two questions are about, are about, like, about, about Gnai, about us being the slaves, us commemorating oppression, and the last two questions are about us celebrating our freedom, and that we're like kings, and, and we're free. So that's what's bothering the child. He doesn't understand the, what part of this night are we celebrating really, because these seem to be two completely contradictory ideas, and the kid can't, he, he, he doesn't walk away understanding. And so the Abarbanel says that that's actually, that explains what the next part of the Haggadah is. That is, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and Hashem or God took us out from there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. Because at first, Matchilin Begnai, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, that commemorates the first two questions. But then, and Hashem or God took us out from there with a strong hand and with an outstretched arm. That explains this celebratory event, and we see that we're fulfilling the mitzvah here of Atchenin Beknai, of starting off with the oppressive element, and ending with the, with the aspect of celebration, of Messiah Vishvach, and then actually builds into the theme of appreciation, right? One of the things, again, the first question was, why don't we say a bracha on Maggid? Because we're supposed to appreciate what God did for us. Now, in order to, a person who shows deep appreciation is someone who's going to go into all the details. Because if someone say, um, is re relating the story of his friend who was saved, and he'll tell the basic story. He's like, look, you know, he woke up and things were bad for him, and then he was saved and everything was fine, right? But on the other hand, a person who personally experienced it will not spare any details. Like, I woke up at this time and it was still dark and I was hungry and it was scary and I heard the wolves still howling and the leaves were rustling and and he won't spare any details because it happened to him. He doesn't want to spare any details. He he can't almost he almost can't help himself from telling relating all the details. And so we see this aspect too here, that, uh, that aspect, if you really want to get a sense of the appreciation, first, start with Agnai, start with how terrible things were. We were slaves. And then, and with, and Hashem took us out, and now we're free. And that's commemorated in the question that the kids ask. Because that's what we're, we seem to be commemorating these two opposite things. That's because we're commemorating the Gnai in order to appreciate the Shvach, the good things that happened to us. Okay, so that's the second element. Um, there's a third part that I really want to discuss about discuss with the four cups, so we'll have to skip it maybe next week or maybe next year.
Now, I want to go to Halach Ma'anya, which is the very first part of Maggit. So, our first question is, the whole Seder is told in, uh, in English, in, uh, sorry, in Hebrew. Why is Halach Ma'anya said in Aramaic? What's the deal with that? So, you can say simply, like, look, that was the language of, of the times when they conducted it, when, uh, when they wrote the Seder. So, because that was the language of the time, they just figured, let's put some part that people understand. Okay? So, that's one way to understand it. But if we're really going to kind of analyze this answer, Rav Bernstein uh, said something that blew my mind, and I looked it up, and I'll give you the exact source. So, in the Shulchan Aruch, unbelievably, uh, in Hilchot Pesach, Siman Taf Ayin Gimel, Si'if Vav, right, so 473 and a little symbol of 6, the Rama comments. And we see that really, there's actually... The, the mitzvah of telling over Magad, of, of telling your, your children the story and telling everyone at, at your table the story of what happened when you were redeemed from Egypt, there's no mitzvah per se of reading the Haggadah. That's just, the Seder, the, the Haggadah is really just supposed to be like a, a launch pad for you telling the story in the, how, the most effective means possible. And, we see, and so if you're just reading the words in Hebrew and no one understands what's going on, you're not fulfilling the mitzvah. And we see this Pasch and the Halacha in the Ramah, in the place where I said, and the Ramah says, he quotes the Re Milandin, right? The Re, he's a Rishon who lived probably, I'm not sure, anywhere between, I guess, 600 to 1,000 years ago, in London, who conducted his Seder in English so that the people at his table can understand what was going on. He did not read it in Hebrew. He said it Belaz, Beloazit, in the vernacular, so that the people around his table could understand what was going on, could understand the story of Yatim Mitzrayim. Amazing. And so we see that hinted to in Halach Mania. That's the first paragraph we see in Magid. Because if you're going to tell the story, make sure you tell, uh, tell the story so that everyone understands. Fantastic. Now we'll just be uh, dipping quickly into some aspects of it. So, Halach Mania. So this is the bread of affliction that our fathers ate in the land of Egypt. Whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is in need, let him come and celebrate Pesach. So to this, we need to analyze. Because what is the difference between whoever is hungry, come and eat, and whoever is in need, let them come and celebrate Pesach? Those seem to be saying the same things. If you're in need, then come join us for our meal. If you're hungry, come join us for the meal. What's what's happening? So first, just some background information. That really, this whole section is a little bit strange. Because when we say, uh, whoever is in need, let them come and celebrate Pesach, the, the name of Pesach is actually, that's not the, the name of the holiday that is given to it by the Torah. In the Torah, Pesach is called Chagamatot, the festival of matzahs. And we can understand why. That's the main mitzvah here, is to eat matzahs. So why do we call it Pesach? So the Pesach was actually an offering that we that we gave. Um, so Pesach this year falls on Friday night. That's the 15th of Nisan. It's always the 15th of Nisan. right? On the 14th of Nisan, then every family was, or family or group of families were supposed to appoint someone to go shecht a Pesach offering, which was a sheep, uh, in the courtyard of the Beit HaMikdash, in the temple, supposed to have everyone in mind, and they're, they're supposed to roast this Pesach, bring it home, and everyone was supposed to eat. And if you did, were not appointed, or did not have in mind to be part of this uh, of this Pesach offering, you cannot eat it. And if the person, the Shaliach, did not have you in mind, then you cannot eat it. Because you're not accorded the, uh, I guess, you have not attached to the midst of eating that Pesach. So when we see, whoever is in need, let them come and celebrate Pesach, that is a strange invitation because really it's too late, right? After all, if you weren't, if he didn't have you in mind at the time he shafted the Pesach, then by the time it's the night of Pesach, it's too late for you to join. So what's going on? So we see that this is a commemoration actually of like, look, while we're still happy, of course that we're free, there's an aspect of mourning. This is like the breaking of the glass under the chuppah because while it's true that of course we're free, there's still an element of galus because we don't have the temple. And because we don't have the te- temple, then really anyone could come and join us for our meal on Seder, even if we didn't have it in mind, because we're not slaughtering the Pesach. So that's one. But I want to focus on the first question. So whoever is hungry, let them come and eat. Then we have a seemingly similar question. Whoever is in need, let them come and celebrate Pesach. Because these are two different questions. There are some people who, you know, but we're basically like, look, do you have matzahs? Do you have wine for the four costs? Do you have everything you need? Okay, well, before you even ask if they have all their needs for Pesach, ask them, is, is the person hungry? Does he have any any food to eat? And we see this, uh, this articulated beautifully in a story uh Featuring the Beis HaLevi. That is to say, a Jew, living back in, uh, in the Beis HaLevi times, about 150, 200 years ago, I think, came to the Beis HaLevi and asked him, 
um, if he's if he's allowed to be yoti the mitzvah of the arakosot of drinking the, the four cups with milk. Uh, so instead of answering, the Beta Levi said, "Look, I'll make you a loan. Why don't you take the money and go buy yourself some wine?" So Beta Levi was very sensitive to this person's kavod. He probably knew that he wasn't going to be paid back, but he wanted the guy to not resist. And he knew if he just gave him a gift, the guy would probably say no out of pride. So the Beta Levi said, "I'll make you a loan." Okay. So the guy is very happy. He's excited. He took the money and left. Now the Beta Levi's wife came and asked his uh, her husband, "You know, I couldn't help but notice how much money you gave him. You gave him way too much to really justify only drinking wine." Like, how much wine does the guy need, after all? He just needs four cups. Why did you give him so much? He would way surpass the amount that he would need to buy wine. So the Beta Levi asked, If someone is coming to ask me if they could drink wine on Pesach night, he's telling me not only does he not have enough money for wine, he doesn't have enough money, enough money for meat either, because he can drink milk. And therefore he's telling me that not only does he have not have wine, he doesn't have anything. So I gave him some money so that he could purchase the, the things he needs for the Seder, that is what's going on when we see whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is in need, let him come and celebrate Pesach. These are two separate questions. Chag Sameach and have a Chag Kasher Sameach.